Hello and welcome back to the Gold Newsletter channel. My name is Kai Hoff and I'm the JR Mining Guy on Twitter. And together with Brian London, I'm your host for this channel. And I'm really looking forward to this company introduction. First time on the channel, so it's a bit of an intro. We're not going to dive too deep into geology. Remain fairly high level because the company has lots going on and they're producing revenue. We don't have a lot of companies on that produce revenue and we're going to find out where that money's coming from. We're going to dive deeper here with Canadian Critical Minerals. We have the president and CEO joining us. Ian Berzins is joining us here in a few short seconds to discuss exactly where the money is coming from because they're a small producer and we'll discuss what that looks like. So before I switch over to my guest, hit that like and subscribe button. It helps us out tremendously and uh, we can bring other companies on this channel and grill them a little bit. So looking forward to that. So Ian, without much further ado, it's great to welcome you on the program. It's a pleasure to meet you. Thanks so much for joining us. Hi, Kai. No, it's my pleasure to join you this morning. Yeah, really looking forward to diving a little deeper here into Canadian Critical Minerals. And uh, our viewers know that, but we always like starting with about a 30, 60 second overview of the company before we get into the details. Can you start us off, Ian? Sure. Our company is a bit unique, Kai. Uh, as uh, we were originally called Braveheart Resources, we renamed ourselves Canadian Critical Minerals, really to align ourselves with, uh, with our assets around copper. Um, we currently have two primary projects. Our flagship is the Bull River Copper, Gold and Silver project, which is a past producer near Cranbrook, BC. And we still have a 30% interest in a large property called Terry in Ontario, also a past producer, copper, nickel primarily, but with some PGMs. No, fantastic. In a short and sweet intro here. Um, second question I always like to ask is bring us up to speed on the capital structure so that we all are on the same level here. What, what does the cap structure look like? Yeah. Well, we've just got over 250 million shares out. Um, primarily, we're still probably 20% insiders, uh, largely retail. We don't really have any institutional, although we'd like to, like to see more of that. Um, and uh, we have... Uh, a fair number of warrants out right now, but they are they are expiring. So, uh, uh, and then we have some options out there as well. Oh, fantastic! Yeah, no, no worries. Um, how, how much cash do you have right now, Ian? Um, right now, we're kind of uh, hand to mouth. Where the the cash we have is coming from the sale of uh, stockpiled ore at the Bull River Mine. So, uh, as of this morning, I just got a check for two hundred fifty six thousand US. So we have more money than we did last Friday. I'm surprised you're here, not at the bank yet, Ian. Uh, so make sure to deposit that. That's, that's a chunky check. Don't lose it on the way. Um, no. <laughs> no, no, fantastic. If, um, you know, you mentioned you were Braveheart Resources. So maybe we start a bit with the history of the company. Like, how did you acquire the projects and what, what what's the history here? So Braveheart originally was trying to advance some uh, small uh, gold mining projects in the West Kootenays. I got involved in 2018. Uh, at that time, they had a option to, to purchase a small uh, gold mine uh, in, like I say, near Nelson, British Columbia. Uh, when I got involved in May of 2018, um, we, funnily enough, within 30 days, we had an opportunity to get involved with trying to pick up a mine that had just gone into CCAA called uh, Bull River. And then about a year and a half later, um, so we acquired uh, the Bull River Mine in January of 2019, and uh, about a year and a half later, we had an opportunity to pick up 100% interest in the Terry uh, Copper Nickel project. So that's kind of the history of the company. So we've morphed from, we have done exploration drilling, but we're really in the development phase now with a small uh, uh, small cash flow coming from the sale of a, of a large stockpile at the Bull River Mine. Yeah, fantastic. R run us a bit through the Bull River Mine, and because it seems to be your main asset right now, 100% ownership. Uh, run us a bit through it. Like, what does the reserve status look like, and uh, how current are the, uh, are the numbers there? Yeah, it's really, it's a unique project. Uh, as I say, it was a past producer with Placid Oil back between 70 and 74. It was in private hands from 76 to 2010. And um, so the, the, the mine currently has a 700 ton a day mill. The crushing and grinding circuit, circuits are intact. Uh, the float circuit has to be replaced and it was our intent to add uh, filtration. So we, would be, so we would be doing a filter tails or a dry stack. Um, the mine is fully developed down 350 meters, 22 kilometers of tunnels. 
uh, accessing the uh, ore body on seven different horizons as we speak. And uh, so it, it's a unique situation. We have over 2 million tons at over 2% copper equivalent. And uh, when we purchased uh, Bull River out of the CCAA process, we bought the shares of Purcell Basin Minerals at the time, and, and that was to ensure that we could protect about $160 million in tax pools. So uh, we thought that that was, uh, that that was a good advantage. So this project will not pay tax for its foreseeable future. And notionally at about a 700 ton a day run rate, uh, the mine would, uh, would run for about 12 years. We have, um, I, I can get into a little bit later, but we had some very successful underground drilling about 18 months ago where we intersected, we have pierce points in mineable structures about 150 meters below the lowest level, which is nine level. So those were very encouraging. And at some point we'd like to expand on that because those grades were uh, as good or better than anything we'd seen at the mine before. So a lot of, uh, to me, a, a lot of blue sky here. Uh, it's also a large land package, about 10,000 hectares. Uh, so uh, at this point, it's really a matter of trying to, uh, the mine has been permitted to run in the past. Uh, we currently have permits for care and maintenance uh, for drilling, um, for uh, some uh, uh, groundwater monitoring, but we also recently gained a, a permit to screen, crush, and sort ore from a 180,000 ton surface stockpile. That, that is making a big difference. I was going to ask you about the permitting situation, what that looks like, because you are moving material now um, to the new Afton mine. Um, run us a bit through what that stockpile looks like. What, what's it, for lack of a better term, the geology of the stockpile? Like, what's the composition of it and how uh, how, you, how, how how much have you tested it? Like, how consistent is it? Yeah, the the um, this material is not low grade and it's not waste, as some people talk about. It's run of mine. So it was material that came from lateral drifting in the, in the vein structures itself. The veins are kind of steeply diff, dipping large 70% quartz. Uh, the primary copper metal is chalcopyrite. Uh, copper represents about 85% of the metal value. And then gold and silver are 10 and 5% respectively. So it's steeply dipping, which is good because that, that will help us in the mining method, whether we do mechanized cut and fill or long hole. And um, we have, uh, so the stockpile really represents in situ material that's come to deck, uh, arguably with 15% dilution in it. So at this point, we are getting assays back from New Afton uh, from our sorting process. And uh, so we're assaying not only the material that we're sending to New Afton, but also the rejects from the sorter. And uh, so it, it is validating that the resource on surface currently is approximately 1.4% copper and about 1.7% copper equivalent. Wow. Okay, so in interesting grades. Um, run us a bit through like get the capex to get, to get the, uh, what, what do you call it, like the, 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 the toll milling going here. Yeah, so the, the, well, our toll milling right now is operational. So there, there's no new capital. Uh, we're currently renting an ore sorter from a company in the United States. Um, that rental agreement expires in end of October. So whether or not we will be able to extend it uh, or not, we, we're not sure, but we'll be able to at least sort to that point. And then we're trying to decide if we buy our own sorter, uh, whether it be from Steinert or Tomer or whomever, uh, number one, the, the uh, it's long delivery and they're not inexpensive, they're over a million dollars. So, uh, so, but right now the rental machine is inside a 5,000 square foot maintenance facility. So we have, uh, we have a solid cement floor, uh, power, compressed air, overhead crane, uh, ventilation. And uh, we have, we've added three different conveyors to that uh, discharge material from the sorter and one that feeds it to it. So that's kind of the setup, and we've got another contractor that's been involved with the crushing and screening of the pile uh, initially. So a sorter, the sorter really can't see or, or uh, differentiate material that's less than 5.8. So when we put it through the, the, the uh, crushing screening phase, about 25% of the 
of the ore or mineralized material on surface gets screened off and that'll be a feed to the mill when we get up and running and then the remaining of the material gets it's crushed to at least minus three inch and then that material uh the, the minus three to plus five eighths is what we're feeding the sorter gotcha um run us a bit through uh, the the purchase agreement that you have with new Afton. and what, what does that look like what, what are the terms in it yeah, so we began that in September 2022. I guess it was that long ago. Uh, in order for New Gold, they like the quality of our ore and they like the fact that there's uh, it's clean. So uh, it was very uh, amenable to commingle for them. Uh, they had to request from the government a permit to to accept our ore. So we didn't need any permission to send it to them, but uh, they needed permission to uh, to include that. With their own with their own materials, so New Gold finally got uh, permission in October of 23. Uh, they have a permit to acquire up to 180,000 tons from us. Um, we would never uh, we would never send the full stockpile. Uh, the grade's not high enough to send as is, so we have to upgrade it in order to send it. But it does open the window that um, potentially we could even look at sorting from the underground and sending that material to new afton going forward so it's notionally about a two-year two-year agreement and um currently uh last month we sent just just under 700 tons uh over to to uh to new afton and uh we're, we're using a trucking firm called arrow transportation to to move the material for us yeah, got you there, Ian. Um, run us a bit through the cost structure. What does that look like? You just said you got a check for two hundred sixty thousand dollars. Like, uh, what does it look like on the other side of the balance sheet? Like, how how much do you owe to to make two hundred sixty thousand dollars? Yeah, we. I mean, we will be coming out with our financials. You know, for the end of the end of the year coming up, we have a little bit of catch up to do, like with BC Hydro, for example. But you know, you're renting a sorter, and I I just I'm a little bit low to get into particular numbers with those contracts, just so I don't want to upset anybody, but we've got a rental contract uh, with the, uh, on the sorter itself. And then we have uh, to prepare the material. It's, it's kind of $7 ish Canadian to crush and screen and prep that. And um, then you've got trucking that's uh, somewhere in the, in the range of about uh, 90, $90 a ton. Um, but so all those aspects are there. So when, I think if we can plateau at that 250 ish uh, on on the revenue stream, um, I think we should be able to net uh, between uh, pro probably about a, a hundred, maybe a hundred and a quarter, so 50 percent of the, the the value or the payable. Uh, but again, we we haven't published those numbers yet. So we, going forward, uh, we're just we feel better talking about revenue at this point, knowing the fact that. When at two hundred fifty thousand US, we are making some money. Yeah. I know it's a bit of an unfair question here as a follow up, Ian, but it's like, what does it look like in terms of guidance? What can we as investors like sort of expect? You mentioned plateau at two fifty. Is that something we can expect every month going forward? Yeah, right now, um, because we have to have shift bosses at the mine because it is a mining site, uh, we're trying to run the operation seven days a week, uh, day shift only. Um, if we if we continue on that path, it'll really depend on the on the on how homogeneous the ore is in the stockpile. And right now, um, for every ton of material that's being prepared to send, we're creating about six tons of rejects, which have between 0.4 and 1% copper. So going forward, once we get the mill a permit to restart the mill. We're not only going to have the fines that are grading, let's say, 1.4 copper, but we'll have we'll be able to commingle those rejects. So we're still going to have half the metal value in the pile will stay at Bull River and will be the initial fee to to the mill when we get up and going. So, sounds good. Um, in, in regard to the ore sorting and technology and the the investment you might have to make, like. October is coming up quickly here. We're already in mid-July. Um, what do you need? What kind of data do you need to make it a, make it a decision here to, to sort of proceed with what you're doing right now? Yeah, if we were going to, well, we'll be in negotiation with the other party just to see what they want to do, whether they want us to return the unit if they have a use for it. Um, 
but if we go, if we have to go to the OEM, uh, well, initially we'd be looking to see if there are other units for sale globally. Uh, typically they're in high demand. Uh, we weren't successful before being able to find one uh, to purchase. So um, I think it's going to be more of a, maybe a process as we move towards the end of October. We need also to decide that uh, right now the KSS 100 does about 35 ton an hour by design. Ours is running a little bit better, probably close to 50 ton an hour when it runs. Uh, but we might want to have the, a larger machine. Uh, a KSS 200 is is a two meter unit. Uh, those are the two options with Steinhardt. And then Tomer has some, some uh, very similar options as well. So we'll need to look at, uh, we have a couple of parties that might be prepared to assist us in purchasing a unit and then renting it back to us or leasing it back to us. But uh, so that topic is, is certainly top of, top of mind right now. How much longer is the agreement then running with uh, New Afton there? Um, if you were to make, let's assume you were to purchase something in October, let's assume November 1st you start, you have the you know, ideal world scenario, the, the ore sorter is, is on site and functional and operational. Uh, how much longer is the uh, the agreement with New Gold running then? So the agreement, the original agreement was for two years from October 23. Um, we are currently in some discussion there to say, what would it look like long term? Are you interested to take our feed? Uh, New Afton currently takes a small feed from Gold Mountain, which is a gold feed. And there are discussions that they're obviously having with others. So they're kind of a central milling facility that can handle gold and copper. And uh, so I can't speak for, for New Afton, but the, the opportunity we had in October is they had a window in their production schedule where they had more mill capacity than they had mill feed as they transitioned uh, in one of their uh, in in one of their underground uh, situations. So, uh, but it's our understanding that they do currently are motivated to accept feeds from people like us, but that'll be really their business decision on whether or not they they, they want to continue with those type of arrangements. The only other facility for toll milling in the province is Nicola Mining near merit and uh, they have uh, they have capacity but it's 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 limited okay no gotcha um maybe last question here on the bull river i saw that there's a three percent royalty uh, on the mine does it also apply to the stockpile and to who owns it yeah so we originally when we bought the mine for about 11 million dollars we had a we had um, a convertible debenture of six million with a group called Coveris. so we ultimately got rid of that converted that when we bought the mine, we, we took a loan from Aaron Matlock, our largest shareholder and one of our directors for $5 million. And about a year or so ago, uh, we negotiated with Aaron where we converted his $5 million uh, loan into a capped NSR. So the 3% the, the net smelter royalty is capped at $6.75 million, and then it reverts to a 0.25 really in in perpetuity, but we could buy back that royalty, I think, for about a million dollars. So Aaron would be receiving proceeds. He also has, there's a minimal, a minimum advance royalty of $300,000 a year. So whichever is greatest, if it's 3% of our proceeds or 300,000, he would get either or, and then any of those monies will go towards reducing the, the, the capped 6.75. Gotcha. Okay. No, in interesting. Really interesting concept here uh, on Bull River. Uh, I think we can put a bow around it. Curious to see what the next steps are, of course. Um, but you have one other project that you own 34% in, and that's a Thierry mine. Run us a bit through that. Like, how, how did that structure come together? Because uh, you, you mentioned it before we hit the record button. It's a bit of an odd duck, so I'm curious uh, what, what that looks like. Yeah, so we own Terry for about, call it three years. Uh, our position currently today is about 30%. And... Um, so the current structure, the mine was called Pickle Lake Minerals. And uh, when we sold operatorship and ownership, um, we now have a structure where Pickle Lake was renamed Cuprum Corp, and it's private. Uh, it's being uh, managed on a daily basis by ORCAP uh, Invest. And uh, ORCAP has 38% 
we have 30. So we've got uh, still a, a significant position. It's a unique deposit and there's about 1.3 billion pounds of, of copper, about uh, 275 uh, million uh, pounds of, um, of, of zinc and sorry of nickel and uh about 375,000 ounces of palladium when that mine ran with umax between 1976 and 82 the first five years they were primarily focused on the copper and it was only the last year that they started trying to to get values for the nickel the nickel recovery wasn't particularly good but the copper recovery was was upwards to 90 percent so what attracted me to that asset was it's uh it is a developed underground mine, but it's flooded. Um, but what we were focused on last year, we did a $600,000 drill program, seven holes, 2,600 meters. All the, this is at a near surface deposit called K11, which is about three kilometers from the, the old uh, site of the, uh, of the mill. Uh, all the holes were successful. And if somebody wants to look at them, uh, ORCAP uh, presented those uh, recently, uh, the results of the last five holes. So when we sold the majority interest, uh, the notion was that ORCAP would drill another, well, they would finance through cut from another 10,000 meters, and we would be able to expand the, uh, the K11. Currently, K11 is about 53 million tons at about 0.38 copper. Um, so it's similar to some of the grades that you'd see in British Columbia. Uh, we didn't get much traction on the project, largely because people thought it's too big for us. And so we really weren't given much credit. But I think as more drilling takes place, it's not quite drilling. It's not quite shooting fish in a barrel. But uh, we do know it's open on depth, a dip, uh, and also on strike. And it's fairly fairly shallow. Most of the holes are not much more than about uh, 250 meters. So it is uh, it is going to be something that is open pitable. And what I like about both our projects is that we're near existing infrastructure. You've either got communities, roads, grid power, um, so you don't have the challenges that a lot of uh, grassroots players have like people trying to do things in the ring of fire. So I think inf infrastructure is terribly important. And uh, in my experience, uh, I just don't think projects like ours get enough enough uh, attention given given how close they are, or proximity they are to, to, to infrastructure. Yeah, I do tend to agree there. Yeah, and that definitely makes sense. Uh, maybe last question on Thierry. Like, what, what are your holding costs? What do you have to contribute annually here? Yeah, so we don't have any holding costs for it. Typically... Uh, if one was not to do any drilling, you've got property tax of about $60,000. And based on the drilling that we did last year, the, uh, the, the holding cost, if you will, uh, for the claims and leases are really paid up for well into 26. So uh, right now, uh, you know, we encourage ORCAP to continue drilling. And uh, we, we think that... Um, you know, as, as money gets raised to do drilling, then arguably we'll get diluted. Uh, whether or not we have the opportunity to invest alongside that remains to be seen. Gotcha. Ian, what are the next catalysts for the company? What should we be looking forward to? I think the next catalyst really is is some, some consistency on this uh, revenue stream from the ore sorting. Um, our permit is the big issue. That's the biggest catalyst. Uh, we are through what's called, this is for Bull River. Uh, we're through the pre-application phase. We have a couple hundred thousand dollars worth of uh, engineering work to complete before we can submit our final permit to restart Bull River. So that's really why we've been a bit quiet on the permit front. Uh, we just, again, comes back to cash flow. It's difficult or, or you don't want to raise money at before at three cents earlier this, uh, earlier this year. So um, it'll really be getting that final permit uh, in front of government and, and then getting it uh, turned around. And we're, we're very positive that it's not a matter that will this get permitted, but when. But at this point in time, uh, government's waiting on us to submit the final application, not the other way around. Gotcha. Fantastic. Ian, really appreciate the introduction here to the company, Canadian Critical Minerals. And uh, you guys trade on the TSX Venture under CCMI. And we'll, we're looking forward to getting more monthly regular cash flow updates here from you, Ian. Thank you so much.
Thanks, Kai. Yeah, and again, we're also trading on the OTCQB as RIINF. And uh, um, so, yeah, thanks very much. And, and it, it was a pleasure meeting you this morning. Yeah, fantastic. Everybody else, thank you so much for tuning in. Hope you found this company introduction in informative. If you did, please leave a like, leave a comment down below. We do want to hear from you. Do we ask the right questions? Keep in mind, it was a company introduction. We, part two, we're going to dive a lot deeper on geology, of course, as well. And uh, we'll take a look at mine life and other things. So this was an introduction. Hope you enjoyed it. Thank you so much for tuning in. Don't forget to hit the like and subscribe. And uh, we'll be back with lots more here on the Gold Newsletter channel.